let me first of all say Happy Mother's Day uh, to the, folk, the ladies out there. And, and I'm saying ladies very specifically because uh, at Mother's Day, I do like to say that sometimes we, we narrow this down to women who have biological children. And uh, indeed, there, we, we are thankful for you ladies who have children. I'm thankful for my mom and thankful for my wife and our kids sometimes are thankful for my wife. They should be more thankful for her as a mother than they are sometimes. But anyway, uh, sometimes we do that. But then there are, there are ladies who would have liked to have been mothers but couldn't. There are, are some ladies, though, who have, have had bad relationships also with their children, and, and Mother's Day feels painful to them. And I think that when God is talking about motherhood, he has a picture that is bigger than simply having children, literally. There is a spiritual child we can have as well, and there are many ladies. All, all Christian women are called to cultivate spiritual children, raise spiritual children, to take young men, young women, care for them, love them, nurture them in the ways of God, and to be a mother in that way. So ladies, um, we are thankful for you, no matter if you're, you're a mother of children or you have spiritual children, uh, and we are with you, and we love you. Um, so just know that on this Mother's Day. This Mother's Day is for you, too. Um, I won't do this on Father's Day because dads are just happy that there's food on the table. Like, they don't, they don't need this kind of thing. Like, I'm just happy that I show, you know, I get up in the morning, my kids look at me, and they don't say bad things, right? Being a dad, it's like, you know, I'm just low bar. Low bar for me, right? Low bar. So anyway. Uh, this morning, we are going to be in Mark chapter 8. I want to say something before we dig into Mark chapter, chapter 8. You heard those scripture readings. If you heard the theme of glory there, then you heard the right theme. We're going to be talking about the glory of God this morning and its value. And I think that is hard for us. Sometimes we have to stretch our minds to think about the glory of God and its value. But that's what we're going to be doing. So, so tune in with me here. And think about that, even as I'm about to read the passage of Scripture we'll be digging into this morning. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 34, hear the word of God. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for it. We pray with me? Glorious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glory that you have shown us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is your glory we see there. And we thank you for these lessons that Jesus teaches us about discipleship, what it means to follow him. This is an economics lesson here. What is something worth? And what is the thing of most value in the whole world? May we be a people who hear these words and are taught these lessons and recognize the infinite value of Jesus Christ and relationship with him. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, here Jesus begins to address his disciples, and he says the crowd, so his would-be disciples, and he's talking about the costs as well as the benefits of following him. There are costs to following Jesus. There are also benefits, and so we want to understand what he's saying here to us today. 
in the 21st century. First, Jesus warns that there will be troubles. So first, he talks about the costs. Troubles, suffering, difficulties. There's a cross that we have to pick up when we follow Jesus. That's the first thing. Second, Jesus promises that there will be treasures as well. So while there are troubles, there are also treasures. And Jesus is saying, look at these two things. Decide which is of greater value or loss. Is the loss of the troubles so great that you wouldn't want the treasures? So Jesus is saying, think about this. Weigh the value of these things. And then finally, third, before he closes, Jesus gives us a teaser. Now, you think about those movie trailers that you see for upcoming movies. That's something like what Jesus is doing here. He, he gives us a teaser of something that is coming. And it is a gracious act. It is a caring and loving act for him to give this teaser at the end. And we'll, we'll talk about that last. But let's start with the troubles, verse 34 and verse 35 of today's passage. So think back to last week. And remember Jeremy's first ever sermon. It's his first sermon with us, but the first sermon he's ever preached. And there, in that sermon, he showed us that Jesus is teaching and asking questions of his disciples. And Peter, he gets something perfectly right. And then in the very next moment, Peter gets something absolutely wrong. He confesses, Jesus, you are the Messiah. That's the right answer. And then immediately he goes, no, but Jesus, you can't be the Messiah in that way. In a sense, if you're putting it in a nutshell, he says, yes, Lord. And then immediately turns around and says, no, Lord. And there's an irony in that, right? No and Lord should never go together. Lord indicates master. So when does the servant tell the master, no, Lord, absolutely not, Lord? So that's what we saw in Peter. And we've got to ask ourselves, why did Peter turn so quickly on Jesus? In one moment saying yes, and the next moment saying no. And the short answer to that is suffering. Suffering is why he turned so quickly. None of us like the idea of suffering. Peter is no different than we are. Peter doesn't want Jesus to have to go through suffering, nor does Peter himself want to go through suffering. So Peter says no to Jesus because Jesus introduces this idea that discipleship, that following him, that his mission is about suffering and a cross. In fact, we don't even like the idea of suffering today. Human beings don't like the idea of suffering, even when we know that that suffering is good for us. Just think about this with me for a second. We know we should eat fewer calories and we should go to the gym. But how many of us struggle to do that? No, instead, we don't go to the gym and we overeat because it's easier. It's too much work to go to the gym. It's too much work to not eat all the food we want to eat. Many of you are feeling very convicted right now. I know I am. I am. We know we should study for a test or we should prepare that presentation for work. But we procrastinate. We put it off because those things entail labor. And so if we can put it off till the next day, then we don't have to go through that pain today. Even though it's good for us to do it, we don't do it. We know we should make regular appointments with the dentist. But we really don't like the dentist because the dentist pulls out a metal hook and starts scraping at our teeth and our gums hurt. And so what we do is we're like, I'm only going to see the dentist once a year. That's what I do. I, I found out that my insurance covers two dentist visits. And the lady was like, I can make another appointment for you in six months. You know what I said to her? I think once a year is enough for me. We know it's good for us, but we don't do it. Here's a true story about my brother-in-law. I'm not making this up. He's one of the smartest people that I know. He has a PhD in New Testament. He speaks multiple languages. He's a real renaissance man, but he hates the dentist. Okay, so this is an elite-level smart person. My sister has to make secretly dentist appointments for him, then lure him into the car under false pretenses, 
drive him in a casual way that doesn't give away where they're going to the dentist office and then kick him out and tell him he has to go in. I mean, seriously. Seriously. If that's not an indicator of human desire to avoid suffering, I don't know what is. Friends, while we might not like the idea of suffering, Jesus is clear about it. If we follow him, we will face rejection because he faced rejection. We will face suffering because he suffered. And we will even face death. For some of us, this means literally, and for all of us, if we're following Jesus, it means figurative death, right? We will have to put our own sinful desires to death daily. We will have to put our will to have everything the way that we want it under, beneath Jesus' will. We'll have to put those things to death. All of us face death. All of us face suffering if we're following Jesus. Now, I am a pastor, so I notice things that people sometimes don't pay much attention to, and, you know, I get my, my pastor panties all in a wad because of these things, and really, have, you know, these things bother me. Uh, so jewelry that people wear and even tattoos that people get sometimes bother me. Now, I'm not judging the jewelry. You know, you can wear jewelry. I'm not judging the tattoos. My wife runs a tattoo business, in fact. So I'm okay with these things. But you guys are all, nobody's going to pay any attention to anything else I say. Because because they're like, his wife runs a tattoo business. Yeah. You'll find out more about that some other time. Anyway. Anyway. What I'm concerned about is the odd choices of what they wear on their jewelry or what they wear in their tattoos. Like a gangster rapper who always wears a massive gold cross. What does that cross mean to him as he spits misogynistic stuff or brags about putting people in the ground? What does that cross mean? Or like a Hollywood gossip columnist who has a cross tattooed on her forearm. What does it mean to her that she has that cross when she brags and boasts and crowns the sexual affairs of the rich and famous? What does that cross mean? Does it mean anything? Friends, the cross wasn't a cool piece of swag for those in Jesus' day. People avoided the cross like the plague. They didn't want a cross because a cross was the most feared instrument of execution, of death, of suffering. It was an ugly thing. It was awful. So when Jesus here says, you've got to pick up your cross in order to follow me, to be my disciple, people were not quickly going, that sounds great. I've always wanted a tattoo of a cross. I've always wanted to wear a cross around my neck. No, people were like, that is a terrible thing to say. They were singing in unison with Peter, no, Lord, never, never that kind of suffering, never that kind of loss. It was statements like these that made many decide not to follow Jesus. And it is still statements like these today that make many of us not follow Jesus, not call him Lord. We think that Jesus asks us to sacrifice too much when it comes to our sex lives. Why should Jesus get to decide whom I sleep with and when I sleep with them? Why does he have to be Lord over my sex life? We think Jesus asks us to give up too much when it comes to how we spend our money. I I made this money. This money is mine. Why should I give it to this person in need who didn't work as hard for me as as I did? Or didn't work at all for it? We think Jesus asks us too much of our relationships. That guy hurt me. I do not like him, so why should I work towards reconciliation and forgiveness with that person? There are many troubles that come with following Jesus. And Jesus is telling us about them. He's saying, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to bear those troubles if you want to follow me. He says, you guys will have to encounter suffering if you're to be my disciple. And this is a warning to us, and I just want to encourage every one of you to think about that. 
We do not want to be naive as we begin to follow Jesus. We must count the costs of discipleship. Recognize the cross that we will bear. Recognize that we must die to self and live for Christ. And that is not easy. There are many, many troubles when we follow Jesus. Yet there is more than trouble when we follow Jesus as well. There are treasures to be had. Verse 36, 37, and 38. I see treasures there. You may not see them, but we're going to look at it. And I think they're there. Just listen to what Jesus teaches his disciples next. And I, I believe this is, this is about value. This is about treasure. This is about ultimate worth. Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is economics. Jesus is teaching a lesson in economics here. A lesson in value. Right? And, and weighing the sufferings and weighing the treasures, the troubles and the treasures. And he's saying, you've got to look, are, are the troubles so bad, so difficult, that it's not worth what's gained? Jesus wants us to really consider this. He encourages us to see the real value of things, the big picture value of what's at stake here, so that we can weigh whether or not to make a commitment to following him does not want naive disciples. He wants disciples who counted the costs and recognized what is gained and recognized what is lost. And that's the lesson here. Now, you've probably read a novel. I encourage you to read novels. I was an English teacher. I love it when people read. But you've for sure watched a movie in which the narrative revolved around someone who was trying to gain something, some goal they had, right? And so they're after this goal. Maybe it's uh, making an invention, you know, coming up with some new technological breakthrough. Maybe it's uh, getting a gold medal. Maybe it's making millions and billions of dollars, whatever it is, right? And you watch this individual going after their goal, and then they achieve it. And sometimes in these narratives, when they achieve what they've been after, they find out it's not all that it was cracked up to be. In fact, they find out that they have had to sacrifice something of much greater value in order to achieve the goal, in order to get what they thought would bring them happiness, and yet it has not brought them happiness. They have only suffering, sadness, emptiness, and they've lost something of far greater value. In the show Ted Lazo, there's an English football coach. Now, the English football coach, I've got to explain this to you Americans here, that means soccer. Okay, so there's an English football coach, a soccer coach, and uh, his name is Ted Lazo. And he has this little, you know, equipment guy, equipment manager, you know, the guy who fills up the water bottles and does all this stuff. And his name is Nate. Nobody cares about Nate, but Ted cares about Nate. And he invests in Nate. He respects Nate. And he finds out that Nate wants to coach. And Ted says, well, help, coach. I, I want to I see you coach. And so Nate begins to coach. And it turns out Nate's a genius. A and they start to succeed. And then Nate gets upset because he sees the success and he thinks Ted's getting too much credit for it. And so Nate betrays Ted. And he leaves to go to the rival team and to coach them. And there he achieves tremendous success. And he is respected by everybody. And yet, in the end, he is not happy. He's not satisfied. All that he thought would fulfill him, all he thought was going to make him happy, it's empty. He's got respect. He's winning games and championships. But it is not what he thought it would be. And then the saddest part is he recognizes he's given away something far more valuable, something he had neglected to really appreciate, Ted's friendship. And he can't bring himself to turn back to Ted, humble himself to turn to him and to renew that relationship, even though Ted would be willing to do it. He's lost something when he tries to gain something else. 
And this is the second part of what Jesus is teaching us here. It's the heart of the lesson which he teaches us about value, about economics. When you're counting up all the costs of discipleship, when you're calculating all the troubles of following Jesus Christ, Jesus says that you should also calculate all the treasures of following him and decide if it's worth it. Because he says the value of some things far outweighs the costs. What good is having the world if you lose your soul? What's the world in comparison to the coming glory of Christ's kingdom? Jesus says, count the costs and recognize the greatness of the treasure. You were made for God. You were made for relationship with the creator of all things. As St. Augustine says, our hearts were made for you, O Lord, and they are restless until they find their rest in you. Or you might say, your soul, your eternal soul was made for the creator. And nothing in the world, no amount of money or success, fame, can ever save your soul or fulfill your soul, restore your soul, give it the joy that you think those things might give it. No, Jesus says, you were made for something more. You will lose your soul. You will lose the sum total of who you are. You will lose relationship with the eternal God of all creation if you don't come to me and follow me. If sufferings are too great an obstacle, you will lose far more than you think you will lose. Jesus tells you, and he tells me, to consider the value of our soul. More than that, there is a concept here that we are really dull in comprehending. It's, it's glory. We say glory rather casually, and we think we know what it means. We have no clue what glory means. We don't know. We think we know, but we don't see the full picture Paul talks about the glory that's coming. And he talks about it in relationships to the sufferings, the troubles of discipleship. This is what he says in Romans 8. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing. So all the troubles, not worth comparing the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Paul says, Look at all the sufferings you're going through, church at Rome, and they went through a lot. He says, it's nothing compared to the glory that's going to be realized in, in you through faith in Jesus Christ one day. He says, set your sights on that. Don't underestimate the unparalleled value of the glory of God. C.S. Lewis has this wonderful analogy. He says, there is this woman, and she has a son, and she is put into a dark dungeon, no windows. And the, the boy is very, very young, so has never really experienced the outside world. And, and years pass, and she realizes, I want him to understand the glory, the beauty of creation, of the world outside these dark dungeon walls. And so she's an artist, and she, she gets a, a piece of paper, and she has a, a little lead pencil, and she starts to draw pictures of sunsets and streams and, and forests and mountains. She starts to teach the boy, this is what the outside world is like. And then she has this sinking feeling when she realizes that it's not getting through to him. Like he really doesn't understand what she's describing. She, he doesn't know what it's like outside those walls. And he looks at that paper and he, he all he sees is one-dimensional shapes no color, just a lead pencil. He doesn't really know what she's talking about. And C.S. Lewis says the boy can't grasp the waving treetops, the light dancing on the weir, the realities which are not enclosed in lines but define their own shapes at every moment with a delicacy no drawing could ever achieve. The boy can't grasp that. All he has is, is the lead pencil drawings, the one dimension before him. And friends, that is you. And that is me. 
when it comes to grasping the glories of heaven. What's before us in Jesus Christ? We see only one-dimensional shapes. Our minds are too dull, too small to really grasp the glory, the treasure that is before us in Christ Jesus. And I could tell you, think bigger. I could tell you, think brighter, think livelier, long for what's to come. And in a sense, you should and I should, but just know, no matter how your imagination is gifted to think about these things, what you think about isn't close to how valuable it will be. It isn't nearly as great. Because now we see only a reflection in a mirror, but one day we shall see face to face, Paul says. Now we only know in part, but when we will, but then we will be fully known, and we will know fully. That's what's before us. So, don't undervalue the glory that is yours in Jesus Christ. And then this brings us to the final thing, which we'll just take a second here with, and that's the teaser. You see, Jesus loves you. And he looked out at those disciples that day, and those would-be disciples, and he loved them. And so he recognized what he was asking them to grasp, the sufferings, the troubles, the treasures. And he saw in them something deficient. They weren't fully able to grasp it. They were really stretching to believe, but they couldn't. This is what we find in chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus said to them, truly, here's the teaser, truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. So part of the genius of Jesus is that when he's speaking to a crowd like I'm speaking to a crowd right now, he can read the hearts, the minds. He can see where there's understanding, and he affirms that and encourages that. And he can see where there's misunderstanding, and then he redirects people so that they might be able to take that next step, reach out and grasp what he's speaking about, and that's precisely what Jesus is doing right here. Wait, we have to pick up a cross to follow you? Oh, I don't know. I I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, you're talking about treasures? You're talking about eternity? I I just can't fully imagine. And he sees that. And so he says to them, what you can't grasp right now, you are going to catch a glimpse of. Even before you die, some of you will see the power and the glory and the magnificence of the kingdom. We're going to look at that more fully next week. I hope you will come back. Next week, I'm going to preach on the transfiguration. That is what Jesus is talking about. You want a glimpse of what I'm talking about? Some of you are going to get to see it very soon. Friends, when you are stretching yourself, because the difficulties, the troubles, the sufferings of this life are a lot for you. They weigh heavy on you when you are stretching yourself because you want to believe and trust that the glories of the coming kingdom are better than anything you could have in this world. When you are at a loss, when you feel weak, when you begin to wonder, can I trust Jesus Christ? Do not despair. You can. He is willing to condescend to wherever you're at, to meet you wherever you're at, and to speak into your life in a way that will encourage you to take the next step of faith. Call upon him to do that, and he is faithful and true, and he will meet you there. Just like he does with Peter, James, and John up on that mountain, so that they can go and tell the world, no, the glories of the kingdom to come, we have seen them. We have seen them revealed in Jesus Christ. And those very glories up on that mountain will find their fulfillment in the resurrection of Jesus. And one day in our resurrection as well. Amen and thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we as a people are frightened of trouble. We ask 
that you would encourage us, give us, give us courage as we face the difficulties of this fallen world life. And may we even celebrate that we face troubles for you and for your reputation and for your praise because anything that's worth having is worth working for and even suffering for. And Heavenly Father, we also thank you that you are willing to meet us where we are, where we're at, and to help us along by your power, by your strength. Give us a vision and faith in the treasures of the kingdom of God, the treasure that is having relationship with the creator of the universe. May we truly long for those kinds of treasures and set the treasures that this life has to offer us aside as we pursue you and your kingdom. May we be that kind of people. And we thank you for this teaser here too and the lessons that we're going to learn next week in the sermon. It is in Christ's name that we thank you for all of this. Amen.